Well, it all happened really quickly. So, so I, I think I, in that blog I had, had said to you that one of the local banks from time to time will call me and just ask me to write up something and, and include the statistics that are regularly available from MLS and write kind of an editorial as to what I think is going on. And in January of uh, 20, they just kind of wanted a state of the union of where we were after 2019. And at that point, we weren't really talking about COVID. I don't even know if I had heard the word at, at that moment. We were and what I said to them was is that I was um, you know, selfishly concerned about waterfront sales going forward from that point because our inventory levels of waterfront had significantly reduced. We, were, we had finally absorbed all the hangover inventory and what I call baby boomer inventory, folks that just had no utility for the second homes or the primary home um, that we were left with from the crash in 08. We were a decade with, at least, with very little price growth and things sit on the market for a long time. And we had kind of exhausted all of the the things that needed to be sold either because of death or duress or divorce, you know, things that just as a practical matter were going to be sold. And we were left with uh, a seller pool, whether they wanted to sell or not, that were apathetic about, ha you know, they didn't have to sell, maybe they wanted to sell, and if, I, and if they could get back to the numbers where we were in 07 or 08, because we were still significantly below those, they would then entertain selling. So my prediction for that moment was is we were going to get to a point where the sellers were going to kind of stand there with their arms holding and said, you know, we're not interested in selling at this price. We're not participating. And we were going to run into a su supply issue. I felt and still believe had we not had COVID that we were that the sellers were going to win that stand that standoff. However, I, what I was, what I was uh, selfishly concerned about was is I think it was going to cause a pause in volume for some time. Because don't forget the buyers for a lot of these waterfront houses. It's still a very discretionary purchase. You know, they would love to have a home here, but it's not something they need. They're, you know, Xerox isn't transferring them here, and they have to have their kids in school by September. This is something that this is on their want list, not their need list. So, so I was, for my own practice, predicting you know much less volume in 2020 than than we had in, in the preceding years um, while the buyers and sellers work, worked that out and, uh, of course covid hit and then once it happened uh, we had kind of a pause where nobody really knew what was going to go on and then it started we still had a lot of inventory sit on the market some things had been on the market for years i think at that moment i had 30 or 40 probably, I think it was closer to 30 waterfront listings, which for me over the last decade is sort of, you know, average or to the, to the high side. This morning before I came to meet with you, I pulled up an MLS, how many waterfront list is, list, listings are active in MLS this morning in Talbot County, the number's 15. Sure. So we started getting calls from our sellers. They would say, you know, uh, I had a really high-end European car with New York tags pull up and knock on my, my door and ask, ask if I would rent my house to them this summer, you know, for $25,000 a month. You know, we saw a lot of things like that, and we started kind of scratching our head. I remember one particular case. I had a house listed for several years, you know, that was the market wasn't absorbing the price. It's a nice house, but just objectively speaking, it was overpriced. And on a Wednesday, I had three or four agents, including myself, set up showings for, for that house on Saturday. I thought, wow, this weekend, we're going to finally get this place sold. And my, the guy I had an appointment with, who, who I had talked to on the phone a couple times before, I think I, maybe I showed him one or two houses, but he was a cold lead. You know, he wasn't you know, crazy, didn't have to have anything. He was felt from Philadelphia, Pull, pulls into the driveway, gets out of the car, um, sits on the hood, wife and kids get out people about my age and they all run into the house and he said to me if she comes out of there and she's smiling i'm gonna buy the house and i said so so i said well here's hoping you know that she's gonna come. and she came out and she liked it he had zero interest in seeing the house he didn't walk around and look at the water he he just wanted to get uh settled and and what we were hearing from folks was is you know people 
always incorrectly said to me, all these people are relocating here. It couldn't be further from the truth. I don't know any of them that sold their home in Philadelphia, sold their home in New York, sold their home in Bethesda, and, came and relocated here. Very few. These people were just going back to the paradigm of having a, a second home somewhere else. So we, had, we sold houses to people who, in, in St. Michael's, that never saw Oxford prior to purchasing the house or never sat and ate lunch somewhere in downtown. He had no exposure to the area other than a friend of theirs has a house here and it sounded like a really great place and there was such a, a frenzy. So that frenzy marched on for, for you know, qu quite a while and in addition to the inventory, which was heavy, that we had, we started having you know, a certain amount of, of folks, sellers, who weren't using the house go ahead and take, take advantage of that. We have slowly been running through that and we've run out. You know, so, so now we're back to a place, two things, where you know, people who never had any interest in selling their house at any price um, are uh, you know, not gonna participate in the market. They're, they, ha they don't care what it's, they, you know, they use the house, it's part of their you know, fa family process. They so there's no moving them and there may not be any moving them at any price. And then uh, we have a set of, set of folks who were always saying to me, uh, you know, we'll sell our house if we could get a million eight for it. And I'm like, well, it's only worth a million two, so we're, you know, you know but if I find somebody, you know, has to have a brown house, so, you know, I'll, I'll bring them over and show them yours. So we, all, we had this latent inventory, I called it forever, of houses that we could go show if uh, we had somebody we thought it was compatible for, so of course, you know, when this all starts, the first thing I do is get on the phone and I call these, you know, 200 people and, and say, listen, this is it. You know, we can get one eight or $2 million for the house. Thanks, Chuck. We really appreciate that. But now we're using the house. So, so I think one of the, the, the uh, one of our supply issues that, that's not very, very well recognized is, is the people who already owned homes here have had a new commitment ceremony with the with the with the property, and, you know, and I believe we have a we already had a slow burning rediscovery going on here of just how wonderful a place this is. I mean, uh, if you're uh, into riparian stuff and 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 really take a study of the hundreds of miles of shoreline we have here and the beautiful coves and the rivers and the fishing and the crabbing and uh, the I mean our wonderful little downtowns and all the investment that's been made in, in you know, particularly downtown Easton and really good for the area and the restaurateurs that are spending extra time investment in St. Michael's. We have so many people that, that their draw here is that they're foodies um, and love the little retail shopping and things like that. And our little towns have, have just, it's just been amazing. I mean, there's no question there's been a sea change in that and I think it's causing exponential growth of, of the downtown stuff. And the, or the stuff in, inside, inside the town. I also think you've seen a lot of people make tremendous investments in fixing a lot of these houses up. And when you, when, if, when you see that, and you know, again, to the, back to the uh, analogy about, you know, I don't want to be the first person to jump in the pool over improving my home. If somebody else sees that and then it catches on fire and the prices, the prices of things go with it. But I, I can tell you that we have many more people buying inland homes for second homes than we have ever had, um, you know, and per particularly within walking distance of downtown, downtown Easton and St. Michael's. The, the retail base in, in our small towns are incredibly strong. We're not seeing any turnover. These are people that run, you know, do a very good job running their businesses and have a vibrant business. And they all, by and large, got through COVID scathed, but sur survived. I would describe the population of our retail business owner as, as, a, as way, way more serious a set of, set of people than, than, than we've ever, ever had before. I mean, they really, they're really in there doing it, slugging it out every day and providing a really excellent product. I think in the last year, even you know, warehouse space, flex space, retail space, um, and, and more recently, vacant land getting sold. Um, I, I'm, op I'm optimistic, but I very often get, a, get uh, accused of being too optimistic. Well, so. I just